Good morning and welcome to the 21st meeting of, the of 2024 in session 6 of the Equalities, Human Rights and Civil Justice Committee. We have apologies this morning from Evelyn Tweed and I therefore welcome to the meeting Elena Whittam, who's attending our meeting remotely as Evelyn's substitute today. You're very welcome, Elena. Our first agenda item for the morning is to invite Elena Whittam to declare any relevant items of interest. Elena, over to you. Good morning, Camina, and good morning to um, the committee. I have no relevant interests um, for this morning's session. Thanks. Thank, thanks very much, uh, Elena. That moves us on to item number two. Our second agenda item is to agree to take item 11, which is consideration of today's evidence on the Human Rights Scotland Bill in private. Are we all agreed? Yep, we are all agreed. Thank you. Our third item is an evidence session on the delayed Human Rights Bill for Scotland, and I welcome to the meeting this morning Shirley Ann Somerville, Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice, who is accompanied by supporting officials, Kavita Chetty, Deputy Director of Human Rights and Mainstreaming, and Trevor Owen, Head of Human Rights Strategy and Legislation Unit. You're all very welcome. Thank you for joining us this morning. I refer members to papers one and two and invite the Cabinet Secretary to make a brief opening statement. Uh, thank you very much, uh, convener, and good morning. I'm very grateful to the committee for inviting me along uh, today. The committee will have noted my letter last month on the next steps for the Human Rights Bill, and I'll cover some of that ground in my opening statement. Last month's programme for government set out our commitments to strengthen the implementation of human rights and to advancing proposals around extending extended rights protection. It restated this government's commitment to legislation to incorporate international treaties into Scots law, developing proposals and engaging with stakeholders. Let me reiterate at the very outset that the Scottish Government remains absolutely committed to the deliverance of human rights and bringing forward that human rights bill. As the committee knows, it was our intention to bring forward that bill during the current session. However, we have decided instead to continue working on the bill over a longer time frame and introduce it into next se session subject to the outcome of the 2026 election. I will briefly explain the rationale underpinning this decision, but first I want to acknowledge the deep frustration, concern and indeed anger expressed by civil society and those others who have worked to help shape this, will, this bill to date. The decision to postpone introduction and to continue the development of the bill was not one that I took lightly. It is the government's view that given the significance and complexity of the bill, there is more that can be done and should be done now to test and refine proposals further to ensure that it delivers the improved human rights outcomes we all want it to achieve. In particular, it has become increasingly clear to me that the constraints in the devolution settlement, which were highlighted by the UK, UK Supreme Court judgment on the UNCRC bill, present a significant challenge to our ambitions for the Human Rights Bill and, as a consequence, our ability to make law that extends, the, extends the protection for human rights as far as we want it to. The judgment exposes the limits of the settlement as it currently stands and how far we can go in practice to advance rights through treaty incorporation. Proceeding now would mean a bill with duties on public bodies of significantly reduced scope, complexity for duty bearers and rights holders, and therefore challenges in making these rights real on the ground. Up to this point, we had to, to an extent, um, accept this challenge as an outcome of the Supreme Court judgment that we had to live with. However, things did change over the summer. The general election has presented, for the first time in 14 years, an opportunity to engage constructively with a UK government, one that appears much more willing to address issues together, including how devolution is working in practice. And my ministerial colleagues welcome this very constructive and collaborative tone from the early discussions we've had on a range of matters, and I hope this will continue to be the case. And on addressing issues relating to the Human Rights Bill, we are determined to make progress. Following the publication of the programme for government, I wrote to the UK government ministers seeking to establish early di dialogue. Officials have been tasked with convening an event before the end of the year to bring together key stakeholders to look at the challenges for rights incorporation and devolution following the UNCRC bill judgment. 
We also want to use this next period to consider further our proposals on the incorporation of the treaties concerning women, disabled people and people who experience racism. Stakeholders have pressed us to go further and this needs careful consideration. In the period ahead, I am also seeking to bring forward early action to advance rights now and prepare the public sector for new domestic human rights duties in the future. This includes to build the capacity and the capability of the public sector to embed a human rights-based approach in everything we do, as well as considering the development of an accessible tracker tool to support the implementation of international treaty body recommendations. I am happy to go into more detail, convener, should you wish to. Even as stakeholders are deeply frustrated, and I know you heard directly yourself, Convener, about that frustration last week, I do very much hope that they will stay the course and work with us on this path. We are determined to make progress. And we must work together to allow that to happen. And I look forward to the discussion today. Thank you, Convener. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I'll open up questions w w with, with a... A comment first, maybe, and, and then a question. In, in your opening statement, you, you referenced the anger frustration um, of, of the human rights sector. And you, you, you said there, you know, you, you want to continue working with, with them as, as work on the spill progresses with a potential um, introduction in session seven. Given, given the long engagement and the long working together of, of nearly 10 years with stakeholders, I think one of their frustrations is around how they were informed that this bill wasn't going forward. So why did you choose to tell some stakeholders about the bill's delay via correspondence, you know, very, very close to the publication of the programme for government? Um, and most stakeholders only actually heard about the delay because the bill wasn't in the programme for government. It does that, how, how do you think you can rebuild that trust with them? Well, that last point is the, the important point for me, convener, about rebuilding that trust, because I absolutely have heard directly uh, that, that that trust is uh, severely uh, dented. I think one of the, the huge challenges, as uh, I looked at what we could do to um, ensure people were aware about what was happening uh, for this, was the limitations that presented itself because of the programme for government. I, I could not go before um, 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 groups of stakeholders and tell them about what was in a programme for government or we would be in more difficulty in another way. Now, I totally appreciate that that left uh, a very difficult set of circumstances about a programme for government being introduced um, and the work that we had to undertake to try and get that message out um, as much as possible. So I did uh, meet with the Scottish Human Rights uh, Commission uh, to update them on the decision um, on the um, on, on the bill, and I also officials met with the Human Rights Consortium Scotland to update them on the decision, um, and that was on the day of publication. Um, other letters went out because that was the quickest way on the day of publication of a PFG that we could get round um, as many people as possible. Um, I'll give uh, a, another example, convener, though, of how I then took that forward uh, just in my own diary, um, which was uh, to uh, speak at the inaugural Human Rights Conference attended by over 150 civil society and human rights uh, stakeholders uh, following very shortly after the PFG to be able to hear directly from people. Thank you. I know Annie wants to come in on, on a similar point as well. Th thanks, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. You have sort of a touched on it in your opening remarks, but I was wondering how do you respond to the stakeholders who say they felt deep disappointment and with the decision to delay the bill, and also they said it was a betrayal of trust and they were blindsided by the decision. How would you respond to them now? It, well, I've tried to deal with the blindsided um, um, criticism there to, to the um, convener. Uh, I, I, again, I, I, I said in my opening remarks, and we'll reiterate once again, I, I absolutely um, 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 understand that deep frustration um, and anger that is out there. And I have a job of work to do to be able to build the trust up that my decision for delaying this bill was because I want to make it stronger, because I think there is an opportunity to make this bill stronger that did not exist in the other 
years where I've been involved um, in this. And, um, and, and forgive me, I'm, I'm not trying to make a, a political point around that. There just has been a, a change in, in approach. Um, so what I was left with was a decision over the summer where we could have went along with the bill as we'd intended uh, to do. Um, and I know in my heart of hearts that bill wouldn't be as strong as it could have been. And I appreciate you heard um, evidence uh, last week that uh, suggested we could um, make it better at the same time as the bill is being introduced. Uh, hopefully we'll have time uh, uh, to go into uh, why I, I, I genuinely just do not see that as a realistic and practical op uh, option. I'm happy to go into further details on that later if that would help the committee. Thanks, Cabinet Secretary. Thanks, Convener. Okay. Th thank, thanks, Annie. Moving on now to questions fr from Elena. Thanks, um, Convener, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Thanks for coming along this morning. Um, in your opening remarks, you um, made clear that you still do intend um, to, to forge forward with the um, incorporation of an, um, international human rights treaties. Um, so if that's still a priority for the government, could you please explain to us how you will prioritise the incorporation during this session of the Parliament? Well, there, there is a great deal that we can still do um, in this area. And I again want to reiterate that we are absolutely committed to the incorporation of UN treaties into to Scots law. We are absolutely committed to delivering that human rights bill. Uh, we need to therefore keep up the momentum around the delivery um, of what we can do in the meantime. We've got areas of the bill where we can still test and refine proposals. Um, and we are also um, very conscious of the fact that, well, I think it would help if a civic society um, could see how far things have developed. Um, and how what we are, we're not asking them to go through the consultation that they've already gone through. We're not asking them to uh, repeat the process that they've been through, because I, again, fully appreciate that people have fought for many years for what was um, going to be in this bill. Um, they are tired. They have spent a lot of their time and capacity on that, and what they don't want is to, to waste time um, so I'm very conscious that we need to uh, move forward with um, a specific proposals that we can do in the next 18 months. Key to that is our relationships with the UK government and how that can be demonstrated too. So those are the areas that I'm very keen to work on around how we use the next 18 months to, to demonstrate that we have together made progress and can use these 18 months to make further progress and how we can, for the first time, uh, I hope, Scottish Government, UK Government and stakeholders having a conversation around how these things can uh, develop. Thank you. Um, last week, some of the witnesses argued that it's incoherent to delay the Human Rights Bill given the Scottish Government's clear priorities to deal with issues like ending child poverty or addressing the housing emergency. Um, Cabinet Secretary, how would you respond to that view? I am, and I, again, I appreciate the the the, the basis for for that challenge because the whole purpose of the Scottish government bringing forward um, proposals for your, for a human rights bill is because um, we did and still do believe that the best way to protect those rights are for them to be enshrined in Scots law. Uh, but I again go back to the point that actually the bill that. Uh, we could introduce at this point wasn't actually strong enough to be able to deliver on the the hopes and indeed the expectations of of Civic Scotland um, on this matter. Uh, we've seen uh, the limitations of what can be achieved with UNCRC after a re reconsideration stage. Um, that's not a position I wanted to, to be in in delivering um, this bill. We have an opportunity to do something stronger, uh, something wider, uh, and to, to be able to look at things in a way which we just didn't have the opportunity to do when UNCRC was, was going through. That's a real opportunity that, that I believe can't be, can't be missed and can't be done at the same time as delivering the most complex bill through the Scottish Parliament. Thanks for that, Cabinet Secretary. Finally, from myself at this point, um, we heard last week from Professor Alan Miller 
um, about the work that he has been doing with the National Collaborative um, to represent individuals um, experiencing substance use issues. Um, and they've been working um, at pace, the length and breadth of the country, um, to develop a charter of rights um, for individuals who are, are seeking assistance in that area. And this was to be incorporated into um, the Human Rights Bill that was to be brought forward. Um, last week, um, you know, there was mention of the accountability gap um, that, you know, the delaying of the bill might um, give rise to. And I guess my, my questions round about that accountability gap, how are we going to ensure that people who have been working on, the, you know, the, this Charter of Rights without the accountability framework that goes along with it, how are we going to ensure that without the, the right to, um, you know, achieving the highest st um, uh, standard of physical and mental health, how are they going to be able to, to get the, the support that they need from their local areas? Uh, and can I put on uh, record, if I may convene uh, my... Uh, appreciation and admiration of the work that Professor Miller has has done um, in this um, area, um, and I think he is once again uh, leading um, all of us to be able to demonstrate how um, uh, this can be taken forward, um, even without the bill being taken forward in the time frame that uh, we had initially proposed, and even with that longer time frame, we do have to continue to. Uh, take steps to further embed that human rights culture across the public services and that charter um, that Elena Whittam has um, has highlighted it is a real um, tangible example of that. Many of the rights that are in the charter are already in law, uh, but people aren't aware of those rights. And the charter is a tool to raise the awareness of those rights and empower people to claim them. We've already seen some examples of where the charter is being adopted and embedded, which I think is important. Uh, but Professor Miller's um, work um, is one of those areas where, again, across government, uh, we are still very determined uh, to take forward human rights in a practical, demonstrable way um, until the bill is ready for delivery next in the um, early in the next session. Thank you. Thanks, Convener. Thanks, Elena. Before I bring Paul in, can I just follow up on, on maybe Elena's second question about specific issues that I think people were expecting to be able to talk about and deal with, as maybe putting it too simplistically. But when, when Parliament discussed earlier in the session the Good Food Nation Bill, and there was discussion about the right to food, and people said, no, hold, hold off that, we'll do that in the Human Rights Bill. Similarly, we, we've heard you know, quite a lot coming well going through and coming out of covid how disabled people's uh, disabled people have not had their rights upheld in so many different areas of, of life and a lot was being pinned on the human rights bill what what can we say to stakeholders and to citizens who were pinning a lot of hope on this bill given 18 months of what they might see as inaction well, one of the key points for uh, uh, me to, to demonstrate is that uh, we're not going to have 18 months of inaction. We will have um, 18 months of uh, different um, action than stakeholders may have, have wished. And I, I, one of those examples is around um, our work on the mainstreaming strategy, uh, which, uh, yes, was also something which um, was linked to the development of the Human Rights Bill moving through to an act, uh, but can still continue without that. Um, on the Good Food Nation Bill and the issue around a, a right uh, to, to food, um, members will be aware um, of a, a member's bill that um, touches on this area. Um, I've, I've uh, met with the member concerned to see if there's ways where um, we can um, uh, learn more about what is planned for that member's bill. Um, and um, uh, officials um, are, are keen to, to, to work um, with the member on that to be able to see um, what the art of the possible is, but we're at the very early stages of that, so I wouldn't want to either raise expectations or dash, because we need to understand what's actually proposed in that bill 
um, and then work out the practicalities. But that's one of the areas where we have turned very quickly, uh, I, I hope, uh, to uh, to be able to demonstrate that we're not just saying oh, we'll still wait for the bill, but actually let's take forward those discussions. And on the aspects around uh, disabled people and their frustrations, that is one of the areas where I'm very, very conscious that the bill as it was proposed to be introduced, um, in disabled people's organisations were telling me it didn't go far enough. Um, and I hear that very quick, uh, very, very, very clearly for them. Um, the, as I said in my opening remarks, the, the ability f for us to incorporate in a different way than we had um, with the situation we have at the moment and the powers we have, um, I think made for a weaker bill than I was comfortable um, with. And the, one of the the points of, of seeking a longer time frame for this is to see what can be done. And I would again point to the limitations of what was actually going to be covered um, in this bill um, for um, the, the areas around um, incorporation. And I point to the frustrations that people um, said in their speeches in Parliament when we talked about the reconsideration of UNCRC and all the acts that weren't going to be included because of the difficulties around scope, because of the Supreme Court judgment. Um, those types of discussions I can absolutely see happening once again around um, the areas uh, that impact on this bill. And I'm not, I'm not comfortable with, with that because we've now seen the limitations of what the Supreme Court judgment uh, means in reality for the legislation that was, that's within scope. And again, I go back to the point that for the first time, we have an opportunity that that might not be the case. Now, um, as I said in my remarks, the relations with the UK government have, have changed uh, markedly, but both governments need the time to work out the practicalities of that. So uh, that's, that's an important part of the process that we need to go through, because I don't want to have another debate, as we did with UNC, UNCRC reconsideration final stages, where people were listing things that couldn't be included. OK, thank you. Paul. Thank you very much, convener, and good morning to the Cabinet Secretary and officials. Uh, I wonder if I can just uh, ask a question about that point on um, UNCRC reconsideration. Um, the, the Supreme Court passed its judgment on UNCRC three years ago. Um, I think everybody knew there was going to be a general election this year. So it would just be useful to understand in that three-year intervening period why it took until now to um, abandon the bill. And did the Cabinet Secretary accept that organisations feel led up the garden path? Well, for a start, we haven't abandoned the bill. And I actually hope this is one of the areas where a Labour UK government and the Scottish government could work together on. So talks about abandoning the bill, um, I think, it is not helpful for that relationship, if I can put it like that, Mr King, because I am genuinely reaching out to work with Labour colleagues in the UK government um, on this. Um, Clearly, there was going to be an election. Uh, with the greatest respect, Mr O'Kane might have thought he knew what the result was going to be all those years ago, but we had to allow that process to happen. And we also had to test out whether the tone and what was being discussed beforehand about a reset actually happened. Now, we're still very much in the early days of the UK government. What we have seen um, very much is that change um, of, of tone. Uh, the dialogue is in a completely different space. But we now need to get past that area and work out the genuine practicalities of how you would deal with the Supreme Court judgment. So um, what we can't do is the Scottish Government come up with um, a solution. Um, well, we could, actually, I'll rephrase that. We could have just um, came to the UK government with a list of demands right at the very start of the days. Um, and I don't think that would have been the reset that the First Minister has tasked his Cabinet Secretaries uh, to do. What I'm keen to do is actually sit down with the UK government and we together work out solutions how to get past, if the uh, UK government wished to do so, to work on the solutions to deal with the Supreme Court judgment. And that's not something that we could do unilaterally. I want to have that discussion in, that, in a completely different way than we've had the opportunity to do. So that's why it couldn't be done, with the greatest respect, until the, the UK government ministers were in place. 
Kevina, I mean, I, I use the word abandoned, uh, and I accept what the Cabinet Secretary says there. I think people feel it has been abandoned for this session of Parliament. I don't think we're going to have, I mean, think we're not going to have a bill in this session. I think it's fair to say, and I think those are some of the, that's some of the language that's been used to me, certainly, by human rights organisations. So I'm, I'm just trying to kind of relay that back. I, I suppose I absolutely accept what the Cabinet Secretary says about the need for a, a renewed relationship, and I think that is important. And I think we've heard quite a lot of evidence about avenues that could be explored. But I suppose what I'm trying to understand is in the intervening three-year period between um, the UNCRC judgment and now, what conversations was the Cabinet Secretary having, honest conversations with those stakeholders that we've talked about this morning to say, you know, what she's just said to me about the need for further work to be done and what avenues has she been exploring? And I will come on to perhaps talk about one of them in particular, but just it's helpful, I think, for this committee to understand what work has been undertaken in the three-year period. Um, so I'm happy to bring the officials in if, if they wish to do so, but I'll give some, some an example of that that I hope will, will help. And I, again, I should say, I appreciate other people are using that the, 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 the words, but I, I am very, very keen that that's um, not the case. Um, I have I have said to stakeholders uh, throughout my discussions with them, I'm exceptionally uncomfortable that, that this bill doesn't deliver what they want it to deliver. And I've been very clear for them all the way out that the limitations of the settlement, given the Supreme Court judgment, left me in a place where I couldn't deliver what they were asking of me and what actually I wanted to deliver. Um, so this was a discussion where I raised my concerns um, uh, about that. Um, there... uh, sure. Where did you come to that conclusion, Cabinet Secretary, that you couldn't deliver what the, the stakeholders wanted? Uh, well, I've been very clear, for example, um, in, in my discussions with stakeholders that the way that we had to incorporate treaties around disability didn't allow us to be able to do what the uh, disabled people's organisations wanted. And that's been a part of our discussion um, for as long as I can remember when, since I've been in this, this post, was they were asking us to incorporate in a way where we genuinely did not think we could incorporate that and stay on the right side of the devolution settlement. So this, that, that ability then, that, that discussion then came to um, how far can we get things under the settlement as it stands, which was the bill um, as we were uh, willing um, or, or we would have been able to, to, um, to introduce it, or do we actually take a step back and try and change that? So those types of conversations were going on for, for some time with stakeholders around my uh, uneasiness that I couldn't deliver what they were asking and not because I didn't want to. Why do you think they reacted in the way they did then? If, if, if you'd been having a sort of three-year period of conversation with people like Scottish Human Rights Commission, Amnesty, some of the people that were referenced in Ms Chapman and Ms Wells's questions, why do you think that reaction was so, I think, visceral is a fair word to use? Yeah, well, I, I, I've, I've heard directly from, from uh, many of the organisations about the deep disappointment, and I think that is down to they have told me that they have a lot pinned on this bill, as the convener has said, because this was the answer to be able to uh, deliver on human rights obligations. Um, and I can absolutely... Um, appreciate that frustration. I, I understand that. I share the frustration that I can't bring forward the type of bill that I would have um, liked to. Um, and I think what much of this comes down to, and I think you heard this in your evidence sessions last week, uh, there is an opinion from, um, from um, some people that we could have introduced a bill as it, it was at the, um, as we were intending to do, and we would have been able to reset the relationships with the UK government, um, changing, um, working together on those solutions. And then once we'd worked together on those solutions, we would have been able to amend a bill that was going through the Scottish Parliament and do that all at the same time. And, and I've, I've, I've had this conversation since the PFG uh, was published. And I have to just genuinely and utterly disagree that that is possible. Now, you heard from some of the evidence that you heard, particularly in the second um, session, um, about how um, the uh, Professor Tekel, um 
um, and um, others just felt that that also wasn't possible. And that was where I was, was coming from. I, I just don't think you can do this at the same time as bringing forward the most difficult and most complex piece of legislation that the Parliament would ever seen. And again, I, I, I hold to that decision because of my experiences when we were trying to go through the reconsideration stage of the UNCRC bill over what was quite a small number of amendments. Now, I appreciate it was with a different government, but if we're trying to utterly change the way two governments work, and then we need to start looking at how we can amend the bill, you'll look how long it took to try and get that to work during UNCRC, and I genuinely, hand on heart, cannot see a way how we could have done that at the same time as delivering that piece of legislation. And I appreciate others have came to a different conclusion on that, uh, but I, I would um, point the committee to the evidence that you had uh, from certain academics last week um, that, that um, seem to, I don't want to speak for them, but the, the, the quotes certainly I've read from the official report also think that that would be an exceptionally difficult, if not impossible, thing for us to do. I wonder if I might, convener, just on that point. Um, <laughs> Professor McCarg last week um, had brought a number of um, suggestions, I think it's fair to say, a range of options on how this might be explored uh, with the UK government. Um, I, I wonder to what extent has that paper been considered by the government and, and w what is the Cabinet Secretary's intention in terms of what will form the basis of her discussions with the UK government? I think it would be helpful for the mm -hmm. uh, committee to understand that. So the work that Professor McCarg's done um, is is exceptionally important in this area, and uh, I would uh, point to uh, some of the difficulties which um, she uh, raised uh, during her uh, remarks. Um, her work is absolutely uh, being taken into account, and it's uh, one of the areas uh, that will help form the basis of the event which I mentioned, uh, where we're keen to um, make sure that we're working with stakeholders to discuss the limitations um, that were um, due to the Supreme Court judgment in terms of uh, scope and how that could be taken forward. Uh, so that, that work um, um, has uh, been looked at, examined. Um, there may be other alternatives, proposals, solutions that come forward, but that's exactly why we need to um, have that discussion at pace so that we can then work with the UK government on what solution both governments um, are uh, keen to take forward. Thanks. I appreciate colleagues might pick up on that, that point, so I'll pass back to Convener. OK. Th thanks, Paul. M Marie, over to you. Uh, thank you, Convener, um, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary officials. Um, we heard uh, last week from Dr Andrew uh, Tick Tickle, um, that, um, obviously on the con constitutional issues and the complexity involved with the bill um, and the need for governments to, to work together um, to address these. Um, can the Cabinet Secretary comment on the discussions that you've had with the UK Government? And obviously, um, you know, from the discussion this morning, it doesn't look as if we had any, but obviously, um, as yet, but with uh, regards to, you know, the issues with the Supreme Court. Um, so obviously, mm. it's not started yet, but can you sort of let us know when they're likely to commence? Because I'm um, obviously kind of really quite concerned there with that. Uh, so we have um, began those discussions um, with uh, the UK government. Um, Angus Robertson had a, a, a very useful meeting. Um, uh, well, certainly from our perspective, I hope the Secretary of State for Scotland felt it was useful um, as well about that reset of uh, relations. I wrote to um, um, my counterparts um, also around our desire to see a reset and for us to work together. I have not had a reply to that, but I don't mean that as a criticism because actually what we're asking for is something that's quite fundamental um, and exceptionally complex. So I hope to be able to uh, take up um, the discussions at a ministerial level um, later um, this year. But one of the foundations which um, is already um, um, well in place, of course, as I think members would expect, as discussions at official levels, there's further discussions to be had um, in the next few weeks with senior officials um, at UK government level um, around this as well. So uh, again, um, that process has already begun. 
Um, but I do appreciate that what we're asking of the UK government, and it's a new UK government with a lot, it's a lot in its inbox, and on this particular area, um, while the tone um, has changed and some of the practicalities have changed, so, for example, I shared a platform an anti-poverty event with the Secretary of State for Scotland yesterday. I'm not sure I could have foreseen that happening um, 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 before. We need to get past that, that initial level, which is really welcome, to those practicalities. Um, and that's a big ask for the UK government, and we're very keen to work with them collaboratively and very constructively on how we can take that forward. And obviously the Supreme Court judgment you know, does bring a lot of issues. Um, so I'm glad to hear that there's hopefully going to be a positive dialogue going forward. Um, regarding the stakeholders, obviously, you know, they mentioned last week um, about you know, clear communications going forward, and it's always been mentioned again this morning. Um, with that in mind, how are you going to keep in touch with the stakeholders? Because obviously, the you know the discussions about the uh, programme for government, etc. But um, so I think it's more so in a kind of positive way, um, so they can kind of work aside, alongside with you. Excuse me. So this is an area where I am I'm very keen to continue to work with, with stakeholders. Now, again, I, I appreciate, and I've, I've, I've said this before, but I think it's important that I reiterate, I utterly appreciate they are tired, they are frustrated, um, and we need to build up the trust again about um, the usefulness and the purpose of engaging with the Scottish Government um, on this. Um, I need to build up that trust um, with them. So for me, um, we have an opportunity coming forward to both take forward uh, specific work on the bill itself and how that can be further uh, developed. Uh, in my opinion, we don't need a full consultation again. We know what people's views are, but there are areas where we can continue to strengthen. Um, and there's also um, a, a need for us to work differently. So, for example... Um, we have a final session of the Bill Advisory Board uh, coming up. That will be the final session where people will, um, stakeholders will have the opportunity to sit with me um, and uh, go through in detail, again, how to use this time, because I don't want to spend too long talking about how we're going to use the next 18 months. I want to start using the next 18 months, but that is uh, another crunch point for that. Um, but we've also got the work that will continue. I mentioned the mainstreaming um, strategy earlier on. There's um, our determination to take forward um, areas from uh, SNAP2. Um, and uh, there's further work that can be um, ongoing um, around the public sector ecology duty and whatnot. So there's work that we can be getting on with. Uh, it's important that we keep people updated um, on that. I would ask them to give us... Um, Again, I appreciate this is a difficult thing to ask, but I would ask them to give us a little bit of time to be able to work with the UK government in a private space because I'm very conscious that what I don't, again, want to do is a list of demands to the UK government and then that puts the UK government in a different position. So how can both Scottish government and UK government work to help stakeholders appreciate where we're got on different stages? Because I think that is um, key. But I think together... Um, we can work well, the UK government, Scottish government and stakeholders, to be able to take advantage of the next 18 months. Certainly welcome your comments, Cabinet Secretary. That's yours. Thanks, Marie. Megan. Thank you very much, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary and officials. The Scottish Parliament is one of the most powerful devolved governments in the world, but there has been issues in relation to the Scottish Government acting out with devolved competency when it comes to particular uh, legislation that has come through this Parliament. So I'm wondering, in terms of the the stakeholder engagement that has happened over the course of the last 10 years in relation to the Human Rights Bill, is it the case the Scottish Government has over-promised and under-delivered when it comes to the time frame and what it can do within its competency? Uh, no, I think what you're seeing is the fact that the Scottish Parliament is not one of the most uh, powerful demolished institutions in the world, as demonstrated by the Supreme Court. And what hasn't uh, lived up to stakeholders' expectations, I think, is the devolution settlement. Well, I would disagree with that you know, completely, Cabinet Secretary, in terms of what this Parliament can do within its devolved scope. I mean, we talk about issues in relation to the Human Rights Bill, in relation to the housing crisis, in relation to right to food. They, of course, come under devolved governance 
and that, of course, is a responsibility of the Scottish Government. So I'm wondering, in terms of looking ahead, is it the intention of the Scottish Government to bring this bill back before the next uh, election in 2026, or would it be the case that the Scottish Government will hang on until after that election? Well, we've been very clear on the fact that it won't be delivered on this uh, session, but if I can give some examples of uh, what we can't do, using the UNCRC as example, there are major pieces of legislation in education which are not covered. There are major pieces of legislation for uh, children's rights uh, that are not covered. Uh, that's the powerful uh, Scottish Parliament that Ms Gallagher uh, is content on us having. Uh, I don't think that that's a place that leaves incorporation of UNCRC in a robust place, certainly not as many children's rights protected as I wanted to see. Ms Gallagher may be uh, content with that. I certainly wasn't, but we had to work within the scope and I respect the Supreme Court judgment. What I'd like to be able to get to, and you know, Ms Gallagher and I can trade thoughts on whether this is the most powerful a devolution parliament or not and we can we can have that debate i'm not entirely sure how that moves forward our ability to increase the scope of what we are entitled and able to do to a point to be able to protect rights so i'm happy to have this discussion or we can genuinely as a parliament um, work with the government and work across the political parties to actually see how we can deal with the Supreme Court judgment in a way that increases scope. Because I would hope that Ms Gallagher and I would both agree that the Scottish Government should uh, work within scope. That scope is exceptionally limiting, as uh, shown by the UNCRC. I'm not happy with that. Um, and I hope she wouldn't be happy with that either. So let's see how, what we can do together to actually include more rights than we were able to. And I think the demonstration of uh, what's not included in UNCRC is not a place I want to get into on a human rights bill either. Well, of course, you know we can take that point, and we can also obviously look at looking uh, towards working together on these important issues. But of course, what the human rights bill, because it's not coming into into place here, you know where we can uh, scrutinise, debate, inform that legislation as things like right to food, right to housing. It's been mentioned by other colleagues this morning, Cabinet Secretary. So I'm just wondering, are you disappointed that we're not able to have those discussions about right to housing, right to food that could have been incorporated within this bill? Well, with the greatest respect, Ms Gallagher, there's nothing to stop us having those conversations as part of the, the work over the next 18 months. That's an issue for the committee uh, to take forward. Uh, but again, I would point out, if we just take the right to housing, I'm mindful of how many acts of the UK Parliament um, our current housing legislation is based on, and therefore how many would maybe out with the scope of any bill that was brought forward. So let's have a discussion about right to foods. I've mentioned already that those discussions are going. Let's have a discussion about the right to housing. But while we do that, let's bear in mind all the legislation eh, that wouldn't be within scope as we carried on just now, just within the two examples that Ms Gallagher has given. Well, I think it's about looking towards what the Scottish Government can do in relation to issues that are happening here in Scotland within the devolved remit of the Scottish Government. And I think that's where the Cabinet Secretary should focus our interests on in terms of housing, in terms of right to food. But we don't have a bill to stack that up. But I do thank the Cabinet Secretary for our time well, this morning. With the greatest respect, Convener, can I push back again? We can't discuss the right to food without also uh, the right to housing. And I give this as an example. Um, without actually having a look at what wouldn't be in scope. So the Human Rights Bill is limited in scope because of the Supreme Court judgment. I want to change that. That would actually increase the amount that would be in scope, for example, on housing. It's because we want to strengthen the bill that we're wanting to go further on aspects around this. So I'm very acutely aware of the limitations of what this government can do in a Human Rights Bill, and I want that to go further. And I hope Ms Gallagher does too. OK, I know Elena wants to come back in. Elena, over to you. Thanks very much, um, Convener. Um, 
I guess the the final question that I've got, um, and this was um, proposed by Professor Katie Boyle last week, um, Cabinet Secretary, you've clearly set out um, the limitations as we find ourselves in with regards to the Supreme Court's decision um, and also the Pandora's box that that could actually give rise to in terms of lots of legislation we've already passed if we looked at that retrospectively. But I'm wondering whether um, you would consider establishing a group of, of custodians on the bill's development to date. And I think that would just transcend um, a, you know, any potential changes that might happen after Hollywood. Hollywood um, election coming up, um, you know, to give some certainty to the people who have been working on this for such a long time um, that nothing's going to be lost. So I listened um, with great interest to, to the um, proposals and the suggestions that were coming in um, around that. And I can again completely appreciate uh, why um, those suggestions are being um, are being proposed. Uh, what I, I would say is that this government is is absolutely determined to carry on its work to, with the Human Rights Bill. We're keen to work very closely um, with uh, the um, civic society and public bodies um, on that. We do need to look at refreshing the governance arrangements because clearly they were set up uh, with the intent of bringing a bill forward. And if the bill is not coming forward in the same time frame and we want to strengthen that bill further, uh, then we need to look at um, areas of specific interest that we need to work on and also how we can um, have a governance structure that keeps an eye on what can also be done in the next 18 months, so not just about um, what's in the bill. So I would encourage everyone um, that is interested um, and it means, um, as I am, fundamentally committed to delivering this Human Rights Bill to, to carry on that discussion with governments. Um, I, I hear that frustration. I feel that frustration. I've um, heard directly about that frustration. Uh, there is a great deal that we can still do uh, to uh, move things forward in the next 18 months, and I'm certainly absolutely uh, committed to, to leading that work forward on behalf of the government. Thank you. Thanks, Elaine. I, I, I want to pick up, if, if I may, Cabinet Secretary, something you, you referred to in your opening remarks and, and just try, try and understand a little bit more about it, and that's the tracker. You, you were talking about it. You, you talked about using the time between now and the, and the election in 2026 to build the capacity of the public sector to, to collect data, to understand their obligations and, and, and their duties, and, and to develop this, this tracker that would allow us to, to monitor our performance uh, against the international treaties obligations. Could you say a little bit more about that? It, sure. So there are, there are two areas in particular where I think we can um, make um, demonstrable um, progress over the next 18 months. One is around uh, capability building activities. Um, and the other one is around the tracker that was outlined in SNAP2, the work that we were doing uh, that, that uh, people wanted us uh, to do on this and this would in effect monitor and support the implementation of human rights recommendations from the international treaty bodies. We've worked together with partners internationally um, to understand what already exists and how that might need to be ad adapted or not uh, for uh, Scottish specific circumstances. But I am very keen to see what can be done on this um, at pace. I'm very keen to see what we can learn from where that already exists um, to see um, if this is an area where stakeholders would be um, uh, content for us to move forward quite rapidly on that. Now, it's made slightly more difficult, if I can put it that way, in the fact that we are not a signatory to uh, treaties. Um, but we need to get past those practical difficulties, of which there are. And again, that's where I hope our very different relations with the UK government uh, may help us be able to make progress um, on this. Thanks. That, that, that's helpful. I wonder, you, you talked about you know, learning and, and looking to see what, what kinds of trackers and, and, and monitoring tools are used elsewhere. I know... Um, and colleagues around the table, if you, don't, if you haven't come across, you should, because it's great fun to play with. The um, Human Rights uh, Measurement Initiative, um, they, they, have a, they have tools for each state um, level that, that, that um, they, they, they I, I don't think they've got full coverage yet, but they, they're trying, trying to get full coverage. Um, and and they, they, they track UK um, the, the, uh, uh, parameters, but obviously, as, as you've just outlined, 
because Scotland isn't isn't the signatory, it's at UK level. I'm wondering, would would you undertake to explore something like the HMRI um, measurement for Scotland and, and explore just what we would need? You know, would it would it need a, require a change in how we collect data, in who collects that data, those kinds of things? Could 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 we do that? Because I mean, I've, I've had fun playing with the tool, looking at other countries, and I'd love to be able to do that for Scotland. I think it, it would show some really, really interesting stories that we could then use as ways to promote human rights in Scotland. Well, I think you're quite right, Convener, to, um, to be able to demonstrate how that tool could be um, used. If I can bring um, Kavita in um, on some of the practicalities that we're already looking at, perhaps. Great. Yes, thanks, Convener. Um, <clears throat> there are certainly a plethora of um, monitoring and scrutiny um, tools and databases out there at a UN level, at a regional level, and at a national level. There's a tracker, for example, for, for England and, and Wales of treaty body recommendations that, that apply there. So we're doing work at an official level to scope all of these different um, options and see what the best solution might be for Scotland in our context. Um, the ultimate idea of the tool being that it really strengthens that implementation and follow-up from UN treaty bodies um, in a really systematised way and supports better scrutiny, scrutiny from civil society, scrutiny from um, committees um, such as, as yourselves with that full transparency as to the range of obligations that sit in Scotland and within devolved, um, devolved competence. So that's work that we're undertaking. We're meeting with our implementation working group later this week um, where we'll begin to unpack um, some of that and we hope to work with stakeholders to take it forward. Super, thanks. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it, because it is, it's those pictures that tell stories, <coughs> isn't it, that we, we can use not only to understand how we are doing, but also to increase aware, citizens' awareness of, of what they, they should be able to expect from, from, um, from us, from, from other public bodies and, and, and elsewhere. If there are no other questions from, from colleagues, I think that brings us to an end of this evidence session. Um, Cabinet Secretary, can I thank you and, and your, your uh, officials for joining us this morning and, and for the evidence that, that you've provided. Um, we'll now suspend the meeting uh, briefly um, before we move on to our next item and hopefully our, our um, Karen Adam will be able to join us uh, remotely. So I'll suspend now. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone, and thank you to Maggie for convening the first part of this morning's meeting. I'm attending remotely today and I am out of the country, so I would ask members to bear with me just in case there's any lag or any delays. Thank you. Our fourth agenda item is consideration of six negative st Scottish statutory instruments, and these are SSI 2024-235, the Sheriff Court Fees Order 2024. SSI 2024-236, the Sheriff Appeal Court Fees Order 2024. SSI 2024-237, the High Court of Justiciary Fees Order 2024. SSI 2024-238, the Court of Session etc. Fees Order 2024. And SSI 2024-239, the Justice of the Peace Court Fees Scotland Order 2024 and SSI 2024-240, the Adults with Incapacity Public Guardians Fees Scotland Regulations 2024 Ad. I refer members to paper three and I welcome to the meeting our Minister Siobhan Brown for Victims and Community Safety, who is accompanied with her supporting officials. Walter Drummond Murray, Head of Civil Courts and Inquiries, Justice Directorate, and Emma Thompson, Solicitor from the Scottish Government Legal Directorate Courts, Tribunals, Inquiries and Access to Justice. Thank you all for joining us the mor this morning and I'll ask the Minister to speak to all the instruments, please. Thank you very much, Convener, and good morning, Committee. The Scottish Government is committed to ensuring that courts are funded to deliver a civil justice system that is accessible, affordable and which provides a high quality service to those who have cause to use it. Beyond this overriding objective, the Scottish Government believes that the fees charged to court users should recover the cost to public funds of providing those services where, where that can be done whilst protecting access to justice. This means that those who make use of the services of the courts should meet or contribute towards the associated cost to the public purse when they can afford to do so. A generous system of legal aid and a court fee exemptions are the most important means by which access to justice is protected. Over recent years, we have enhanced these protections. For example, those applying for domestic abuse interdicts or exclusion orders are automatically exempt from paying court fees. And in 2022, environmental cases within the meaning of the Aarhus Convention were also exempted from the court fee in the court of session. I want to go further in the future when resources allow. The instruments before you today establish statutory fee charging regimes which the Scot Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service, or the SCTS, administer. Therefore, the Scottish Government works very closely with the SCTS on its fees policy. Court fees have generally been reviewed every three years, with the last full round being implemented in 2022. We do not increase fees annually each year in line with inflation. However, we do need to increase them when it is necessary to reflect increased costs. That is why you have the SSIs before you today. The wider context of pressure on public finances brought about by significant reductions to the funding Scotland receives from the UK Government allied to inflationary pressures that we're all very well aware of means that it is unsustainable not to consider court fees increasing. As a result of this high inflation and increased costs falling upon the SCTS, the rate of recovery has dropped significantly to 57% in the year 2023 to 2024. I set out in my letter to the committee the reasons why these SSIs are necessary and the potential impact on the SCTS should they not receive the additional funding sought through these court fees. The expansion of civil online in the Sheriff Court is one example of something that may have to be curtailed. Essential improvements to the Office of the Public Guardian System is another, and work to develop a trauma-informed domestic abuse court, court is a third. 
Beyond these examples I mentioned in my letter, there is simply the risk of delays increasing to the detriment of all of those involved in the court system as a result of a short shortfall in projected income of around £4 million per year. We cannot ignore the fact that we are facing financial challenges, and we have sought to balance that against maintaining a robust £141.3 million fund for legal aid and court fee exemptions to protect those who could not otherwise afford access to justice. I urge the committee to pass these SSIs today to ensure that the courts get the increased fees they need to reflect inflationary rises and can continue the work they do in providing justice to those who seek it. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. We will now move on to questions on the instruments from members, if members wish to indicate if they would like to come in. Marie. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, thank you, Minister, and, and obviously your officials. Um, court exemptions uh, were sort of uh, discussed last week. Are you likely to review them? Yes. Well, at, at the moment, we are to, I do want to in the future because of inflationary pressures. It's not something we can address at the moment, but moving forward, we do. Thank you. Um, obviously, you've kind of mentioned, you know, the impact. If we, if we don't agree these SSIs, could you maybe further expand on that? Sure. So I did set, set this out in my letter to the committee last week. So the expansion of civil online in the Sheriff Court is one example of something that may have to be curtailed. And essential improvements to the Office of the Public Guardian System is another. And work to develop a trauma-informed domestic abuse court is a third. Beyond these examples I mentioned in my letter, there is simply the risk of delay increase to the detriment of all those involved in the court system, but it would be up to the Scottish courts to decide where, where they would make these cuts if they didn't get this £4 million a year. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now move on to a question from Maggie Chapman, please. Thanks very much, convener. Good morning, Minister, and thank you. thank you for the letter that you sent last week and, and for your comments, your, your statement this morning. I just have a couple of questions to delve into some of the costs in, in a little bit more detail, if, if that's OK. You mentioned in your statement the, the, the figure of 57% cost recovery, um, that, that it has fallen um, to that. The last figure that I could find was for, for 20, uh, 2017, where cost recovery was 87%. Um, that... It seems to me that it's more than just inflation that's going on. Can you say a little bit more about that shift, that change? Yes, so we do know with inflation over the last couple of years that it has gone to 57% in the last year. I do not know the history, going back to the one that, that you um, mentioned there, but I might bring in Walter if that's all right, because he'll know the history to speak to that. Yeah, thank you, convener. Um, I mean, this is the figure that is provided by SCTS, who follow their methodology um, for analysing what are the costs of the civil justice system. I mean, specific examples are pay, um, most obviously, and the inflationary pressures that um, we're all aware of in terms of energy, building maintenance, and so on and so forth. That's been significant investment in digital, um, which explains it, and that's really as much as I can say. But it is SCTS's responsibility to provide a figure, and that's the one that they provided for the most recent year. OK, th thanks. If, if uh, it, Just following on from that, you, you talk about pay and, and inflation being, being the pressures that, that you assume, given the figure that you've got from, the, from SCTS, and I appreciate it's their, it's their figure, it's, it's their methodology. Um, in the Scottish Court Fees 2024 to 2025 consultation document, um, there, there's a, an analysis of inflationary pressures. And um, other than the one year where it was over 10%, all of, all of the figures in the consultation document are under 10%. So what's the rationale for the 20% increase for some of the court fees that we have before us this morning? Yes, if I can answer that, convener, if I may. Whilst the fee increases are more than previous years, they should be seen in the context, context of soaring inflation that we've experienced over the past few years and the increased associated costs, which Walter did mention there. In 2021, there was no fee increase due to the pandemic, and in 2022 and 2023, the increase was 3%, and 24, it was 
2 per cent. There are, are no plans to, for any other further increases until the 1st of April in 2026. And it, this is looked over a five-year period with the total increases which would be in line with the post-pandemic inflation as measured by the CPI. I think one of the things, just to highlight, the, the fees that have been selected for the higher percentage increase were chosen because they are lower in nominal terms, thus minimising any impact to access justice. Specific examples, which I know I did mention in my letter to the committee last week, was that fees for the share of court caveat, which is proposed to rise from £48 to £58, and the fee for lodging a motion, which is proposed to rise from £54 to £65. Thanks, Minister. I, I appreciate what you say, but, but, you know, at no point in the last three years have we had inflation in, uh, approaching 20 per cent. And at, e even if, if the fees are, are, are lower in absolute terms, that's still a, a, a pretty steep, steep in increase. It's just something I, I don't see evidence for. Given the, the, given the numbers in the consultation document themselves, you know, which talk about CPI being um, last year 5.4 per cent, this year 0.6 per cent. Um, RPI last year 8.1 per cent, this year 1.2 per cent. These are the Scottish Government's own figures in the consultation document. Given we've already had a 2 per cent rise this year, I don't see how in the year we can justify a 20 per cent increase. Yes, I, 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 will, I will bring in um, Walter in one moment because he will be able to um, go the history for the last five years. But one thing we do have to, this is money to fund the court system that is needed due to the inflationary pressures over the last couple of years. When you look at access for justice, our most vulnerable that need access for justice are covered by the exemptions and by legal aid. And when you're, when you're seeking litigation, usually the, the legal fees are a lot more higher than the court fees. For example, in Scotland, where you have um, solicitors rates, you have I think depending on the type of work and the experience, it starts at £125 per hour to anything over £300 per hour. But I will bring in Walter about the inflationary rates. Yeah, thank you, convener. Um, I just wanted to make the point that you're right that inflation at any point over the last couple of years has been around 10%, but looked at over three, four years, you quickly get to around about 20%, which is the overall effect of this order. So while some fees have gone up by 10% and some have gone by another 10% on that, the average is probably about 13%. 13, 14%, and that's what we're trying to achieve. It's just a reflection of inflation, but over a longer period rather than just sort of the last 18 months. Okay. My, my final question, if I may, uh, convener, is, is around j just, well, maybe it's not really a question, maybe, maybe it's a statement. We heard very clearly last week um, from people who support um, citizens seeking justice that actually quite a lot of them fall through the cracks of legal aid that you, you said you know if people are struggling they will be covered by legal aid well often they are not covered by legal aid because either you know the, the solicitors the, the 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 professionals don't exist in areas where they are needed or they need to travel um to to find that legal legal aid support so i i I, I'm sorry, I, I just don't agree that legal aid provides the cushion that, that, that you've, you've um, claimed it does, given how patchy legal aid, uh, legal aid um, access is across Scotland. If I just can go to that point, and, and this is an issue that has been raised, legal aid is demand um, Demand led, so we have the budget for last year of over 141 million pounds. If during that year it goes over because it's demand led, the Scottish government do have will have to pay for that. I do know that there is work currently going on um, by the Scottish Legal Aid Board where they're looking geographically on the areas that do need uh, legal aid and how we how how we can solve that. So we are in working um, with the with. SLAB and also the legal profession and how we can improve access to justice through legal aid. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll leave there. Thank you. Thanks. Convener. Thank you. We'll now move on to questions from Elena Whitton, please. Thank you, convener, and good morning, um, Minister. I have a few questions. Um, first, um, can I start off with whether or not you have any analysis or statistics on what proportion of court fee income is paid for by banks, the insurance industry, or similar large bodies, um, and those of individuals um, themselves. Do you have any of that um, type of information? Thank you, Ms. Vision, for your um, question. No, SCTS does not track 
who is litigating in a form that would allow us to provide those specific statistics. However, we can say that a very significant proportion of the litigation is conducted by large organisations from both the public and private sectors. And specifically, the insurance industry is a major litigant in the field of personal injury. And thanks to the qualified one-way cost shifting, it meets the expenses of both the parties in the large majority of cases. Um, thanks very much for that answer, Minister. I'm wondering whether you could indicate to us at all whether you um, would, un would know the average cost to an individual f of a court fee. Uh, I do not have those, those, that exact price at the moment. I think um, the data that allows for the fee to be broken down a form would be useful. However, the cases differ depending on how much of the court's time is used. So it's unique to each in individual case. So many cases will settle without a hearing and accordingly the fee may be low although there may be cases that reach lengthy hearings in the court of session with multiple motions, which could become more expensive. So it's very difficult just to pinpoint an average cost there. Okay, so if we can't um, pinpoint an average cost there, um, I'm wondering whether there's another comparison that we could look towards um, our neighbours and the rest of the United Kingdom. How do our um, fees compare um, to the rest of the UK? So my understanding is, I will bring in Walter, that our, our court fees are less than in England and Wales. Um, just one to note is for a divorce um, fee in England and Wales, it's £593, but in Scotland it's only £150. So there's a comparison just for one of the fees, but I don't know, Walter, have you got any further information? Um, I'd only add it's difficult to make these comparisons because of the different legal systems. The England and Wales system is um, more front-loaded, where there's a higher initial fee, but then they have less fees through the course of the case. Um, but I think it is fair to say they are higher on average, as the Minister quotes that example. Um, particularly, um, their system is more predicated on the value of the claim. So a claim, I think, of 100,000, but of a £5,000 fee, which would be much higher than would normally occur here, unless it was extremely complex in terms of the hearings. Thanks for that. Um, I guess finally from, from myself just now, convener, um, you know, in the letters to, to the committee, you do outline, Minister, how, um, you know, that the system itself is created with um, fairness baked into it as far as, as, as can be done to allow people access. Now, notwithstanding Ms Chapman's comments about access to, to legal aid, which I do take on board, I'm wondering, you know, if these instruments are, you know, not um, passive, if they are annulled, we, you've said out already the impact that that might have on the court service itself, but I'm wondering if we could look beyond that to look at, you know, the tribunals and the chambers um, that, that are associated as well, where there are, there are generally no fees for, for, you know, the public to be able to actually attend those settings. I'm wondering what impact would it have on, on those settings where, you know, we're looking for people to access justice when it comes to access to housing, um, to the mental health tribunal, etc. What could be the consequence for people? As I said previously, it would be up to um, the Scottish courts to determine that if they, this funding of £4 million a year wasn't um, raised on their behalf. But as I did set out in my letter to the committee, the expansion of the civil online in the Sheriff Court is one example that's been mentioned that may have to be curtailed. And beyond all the examples that I've already mentioned today and I mentioned in my letter, there's simply a risk of delay in increasing the, um, and it'll be detrimental to the court system. Thanks, Convener. Okay, thank you. We have no indications of any other members wishing to ask any questions. So that completes our evidence taking on the SSIs, and we will now move on to the various motions to annul the instruments. And once again, I will pace myself and take my time just because I am um, remote today and just to get us through this so you can clearly understand everything that I am saying. So thank you for your patience. So the fifth agenda item is to consider a motion to annul SSI 2024-235, the Sheriff Court Fees Order 2024. A motion to annul has been lodged in the name of Maggie Chapman. Having had the opportunity now to question the Minister on this SSI, I'm now going to invite the committee to dispose of the motion to annul. 
I invite Maggie Chapman to move motion S6M14789 in her name and make any brief additional comments she wishes to make. Maggie, please. Thank, thanks very much, convener. And can I can I thank um, the convener and, and the minister for, for their comments? I will move the motion in, in my name this morning. Um, I have some comments that I would like to make. Um, th th these actually cover all of the motions, so I'll, I'll only say all of this once. You'll be, you'll be pleased to know. Um, so I, I am grateful to the minister and the Scottish government to resp for responding to the concerns which we've heard and discussed uh, both this morning and at previous meetings. But I have to say that for, for me, and I know for, for many in the sector who support and provide advice and advocacy as well as uh, legal support itself, um, the response isn't sufficient to allay those concerns. That is why I am pressing my motions this morning. There are, in my view, four areas of significant difficulty. The first is the assumption that full cost recovery is, necessary, is a necessary goal to which we should aspire. On the contrary, Many experts, legal scholars, as well as social justice advocates, believe it to be deeply problematic. Justice is a matter of public and common good, a benefit to the whole society, not just to the participants of a particular case. If justice is presented as a consumer luxury, one which only the privileged can choose to indulge, all our communities will be harmed. Our trust in the rule of law threatened and our human rights no longer universal. That is recognised in the context of many tribunals, including following the Unison case in employment tribunals. And that principle should, as the consortium, the Human Rights Consortium suggests, also be applied to human rights, equality law and public interest cases, situations where the very fundamentals of this committee's work are centrally concerned. The second problem with these orders is the lack of justification for such steep hikes in fees. 10 to 20 per cent in addition to the regular annual increases. Costs, including energy, have increased, as the Minister has noted, but wages have not risen in line with inflation. And so the burden falls more heavily on those struggling individuals and families than it does on institutions. As the Human Rights Consortium has highlighted, these rises will disproportionately impact those who are already marginalised, those who are unable to obtain their basic human rights, including to an acceptable standard of living, to privacy and family life, to freedom from discrimination, to independent living and inclusive education without litigation. Some of those people will be exempt from fees, but not all. Some of those people will be eligible for legal aid, but again, not all. And the shortage of legal aid solicitors mean that even those who are eligible may need to pay privately for legal assistance or to bring cases in person the latter representing a significant cause of delay and expense to the court system. The third difficulty is that we have received, I think, not, not enough clarity from the Scottish Government about the proportion of the overall SETS budget that is expected to be dependent upon these fee increases. We've seen a list of projects which the Minister tells us may be under threat, but no detailed costings of, or, or indication of priorities. Evidence suggests that higher fees deter claimants from embarking on litigation in the first place, so we cannot be confident of the overall financial effects of such a dramatic rise. I would also suggest that while many of the initiatives are laudable, and some, such as the remote provision of evidence for police and expert witnesses, will benefit other bodies and individuals, few of them are more important than the maintenance of access to justice in and of itself. My fourth and final concern is about the wider access to justice barriers we are seeing in Scotland today. And this broader context represents my primary concern. The Human Rights Consortium says that, and I quote, the minister's letter misses the mark by not engaging with the underlying crisis in civil legal aid that many people are facing today, end quote. As I mentioned before, that crisis is not only about eligibility, but also about accessibility. It is of little use knowing that if you qualify for legal aid and if it is impossible for you actually to find and consult a legal aid solicitor. The fact that legal aid advice and representation are so prohibitively expensive shouldn't be an excuse for raising court fees, but an incentive to make real and overdue change. The Scottish Government's failure to comply with its Aarhus commitments, its failure to include legal aid reform in the current programme for government, 
and its failure to reverse the devastating cuts to Stream 2 funding, the ERAP Stream 2 funding, must all, along with these fees orders, be matters of deep disquiet to this committee. I invite us to act upon these justified concerns, and I would urge colleagues to vote with me on the annulment of these instruments. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie. Can I invite any other members present, followed by the Minister, to make any further brief remarks that they wish? Paul, please. Thank you, Thank you very much, Convener. Um, unfortunately, I was absent from committee when we took evidence on um, the, these issues. Um, however, I have obviously read uh, some of the evidence. and. I suppose I approach this uh, seeing uh, much in the arguments made by uh, Maggie Chapman that I think are important, that I think need to be put on the record and explored, and I think particularly on that point about wider access to justice. Uh, and I really do hope government will reflect on those points. I think particularly in terms of, a, I think it's fair to say a crisis, essentially, in legal services, particularly around access to um, sufficiency of uh, lawyers in crim criminal defence trials, uh, and indeed lawyers being available um, through uh, legal aid. Um, I've had a number of um, constituency issues around the pursuers panel as well, in terms of um, solicitors, uh, you know, pursuing solicitors who are at fault. So I think there's a range of issues across this which, which do need to be looked at in the round. Um, and I really do hope government are taking that on board today. So I have a degree of sympathy with uh, Ms Chapman's approach. However, I am concerned by what would happen to the court system if we do in all these regulations. Um, I appreciate the, the costs that are involved and the increases uh, and the arguments that have been made. Um, so I would be much uh, more comfortable, I think, if I could see in summing up from the minister what action, further action she intends to take as a result of this discussion. But I do share the concerns that um, annulling um, these instruments may have a, a knock-on impact. Thank you very much, Convener. Thank you. We'll now move on to Marie McNair, please. Thank you, um, Ms Chapman. Um, having heard from the Minister, um, obviously, about the impact, you know, if we were to annul these um, SSIs, um, have you taken um, into consideration the, the impact on the courts, and particularly the tribunal services, um, if your motion was successful? That's a direct question to me, convener. Do, do, not ask them. do you want me to ask? Yes, please. OK, OK. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I mentioned your name first, so obviously he never picks it up. Yeah, no, no, sorry, I, th I thought we were just yeah. having having um, contributions um, for or against the motion. I, I think, as I said in my remarks, I, I hear the Minister's um, concerns and, and the, the, the impact that, that she has outlined, but there's actually no detail to any of that. You know, we, we know that for the, last, for the last year for which we, we have uh, figures, um, civil court running costs were £40 million. Uh, the Minister's mentioned a £4 million um, value for, 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 for these fees. There, there's no, no indication of if, if, these, motion, if these motions um, do not pass and, and, and these increases go through. There's no oh, sorry, if these motions pass and these increases do not, not go through, there's actually no information. We've got no information of what the, civil, what the SCTS will do differently. We, we don't have that information, despite having asked in a letter to the Minister uh, previously. We, we don't know exactly of, of that impact. And I, I think we've heard, you know, general words about there will be an impact, but there's no quantification to that at all that we've heard this morning or in writing previously. Thank you. We'll now move on to a question from Megan Gallagher, please. Thank you very much, convener. And it's just to um, relate myself to the comments that Paula Kane made in relation to access to uh, legal services being vitally important for everyone. Um, you know, we've been speaking about human rights this morning, and again, we need to make sure that people can access legal services when needed. But again, I do share the concerns in relation to the annulment as uh, presented within the motion. It's not because I don't believe that this matter should be looked into. It absolutely should. And what I would like to seek reassurance from the Minister on would be in relation to the review of legal fees 
that she briefly touched upon um, within her opening statement. I think that's something you know that either the the committee could explore um, via the Equalities Committee, or if it's something indeed that the Scottish Government um, is going to pursue directly on the back of what we're discussing today. So that would be really helpful if the minister could include that in summing up. But certainly, um, I do sympathise um, with the the points that are being raised in relation to making sure that people can get access to justice support when needed. Thank you very much, Convener. Thank you. Alina Whittam, please. Um, I do have, uh, as my colleagues have already said, I do have some sympathy with um, the motions that, that Maggie Chapman has laid down today. I think all of us want to see a system um, that has fairness baked into it and access across the board. As a former women's aid worker, I you know, saw time and time again the issues um, that women face trying to access justice. We've heard from the Minister about the fact that we've already dealt with um, some of the exemptions in that area, which were very welcome. I do take on board Ms Chapman's comments about um, we don't have a level of detail from, you know, where the, the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service would um, seek to make um, changes in relation to this £4 million um, difference. Um, but I think £4 million will make a difference if we don't um, proceed with um, the instruments that the Minister has laid down today. So for that reason, um, I, you know, I, whilst I do sympathise, um, I think that the, the committee as well has been quite clear in seeking more information going forward about how we deal with um, uh, you know, access to legal aid, access to justice, and I would hope that that would be coming forward um, in, in you know, evidence sessions to come down the line. Thank you. Thank you. There are no other requests, so we now move to the Minister to respond, please. Thank you very much, Convener. And if I could urge um, committee members to please support these SSIs to fund the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Services. Budgetary pressures means that we can't ignore the impact of, of inflation over the last couple of years. And I, I, do, um, I do pick up all your points and I will come to it regarding legal aid, but we do, we have, access to justice is currently protected by legal aid and court fees exemptions. And court fees, as we know, are generally a very small part of the cost of an action um, when paying for legal advice. Is, is, is far um, more expensive and a, big, a bigger issue. Moving on to um, legal aid and access to justice, the Scottish Government totally acknowledges the importance of access to ju justice as well as the reform of legal aid. The Scottish Government has taken significant steps to assist legal aid providers, which has led to an increase in legal aid fees of 25% since 2019. And as I said previously um, to Maggie Chapman, the number of legal aid solicitors can fluctuate for a variety of reasons, and the issue of solicitor availability is being explored by the Scottish Legal Aid Board, and they're currently undertaking a comprehensive ana analysis which will look into detail of the legal aid activity at a geographical and a subject um, matter level, and I will continue to work with the legal profession and others to identify measures on how we can improve Scotland's legal aid system. Moving forward, if these to be passed today, and as we move forward to the next consultation um, in 2026, I, I can today say that I'd be happy to commit to a further um, consultation which would have the public's interest at heart moving forward to the next next fee review. Thank you, convener. Thank you, Minister. <clears throat> Can I now invite Maggie Chapman to respond and indicate whether she wishes to press or withdraw motion S6M14789. Thanks very much, convener. I, I won't, I won't um, repeat what I said, but I, I, I would just flag to colleagues that the main reason given for this is inflationary pressures. And we, we heard in, in response to questions earlier that the, the, we look, the government is looking for about an average of a 13% increase in, in fees uh, through court, court uh, fee increases. However, the, let, let, let's not forget that, as the minister outlined, the there have already been increases, 3% in 22, 3% in 23, 2% earlier this year in, in April. So it's not like we're going from 0%. And I think that we need, we need to take that into consideration. 
on that basis, I think these increases are out of line with, with what is, is appropriate, never mind the point I made earlier about not, not believing full cost recovery in the justice system to be a, an appropriate repro uh, approach. Justice should be universally available, not just for those with the ability to pay. And on that, I press my motion. Thank you. The question is that the Equalities, Human Rights and Civil Justice Committee recommends that the Sheriff Court Fees Order 2024, SSI 2024-235, be annulled. Are we all agreed? Yes. That is not agreed. There will be a division. Can I ask those in favour of the motion to raise your hand? That noted. Can I ask those opposed to the motion to raise your hand? Thank you. Can I ask those who are abstaining to raise your hand? Is there any abstention? Thank you. The vote is one against, sorry, no, the one, the vote is one for, against five, and zero abstentions. Was my vote not counted? Apologies. I'm, I'm not sure we could see your hand, Karen, just sorry, in the my, screen. Yeah, yeah. apologies. It was just, it was out of shot. Just, it, it, for the next votes, just put, put your hand closer to your face. <laughs> Apologies, that's the, the first hiccup. Okay, so the motion to annul is disagreed to. We will now move on to agenda item six. The sixth item is to consider a motion to annul SSI 2024-236, the Sheriff Appeal Court Fees Order 2024. A motion to annul has been lodged in the name of Maggie Chapman. I'm now going to invite the committee to dispose of the motion to annul. I invite Maggie Chapman to move motion S6M14790 in her name and make any brief additional comments she wishes to make. Thanks, Karen. I move the motion in my name and I won't say anything further. Thank you. Can I invite any other member present, followed by the minister, to make any brief remarks that they wish? Nope, no requests. Minister. Thank you, convener. I've got no further comments. Thank you. Can I ask Maggie Chapman to indicate whether she wishes to press or withdraw motion S6M14790? I press. She's pressed. The, the question is that the Qualities, Human Rights and Civil Justice Committee recommends that the Sheriff Appeal Court Fees Order 2024, SSI 2024-236, be annulled. Are we all agreed? Yes. No. That is not agreed. There will be a division. Can I ask those in favour of the motion to raise your hand, please? Can I ask thank you? Can I ask those opposed to the motion to raise your hand, please? Can I ask those who are abstaining to raise your hand? The result is one for, six against, zero abstentions. The motion to annul is disagreed to. 
We will now move on to item uh, agenda item seven, and it is to consider a motion to annul SSI 2024-237, the High Court of Justiciary Fees Order 2024. A motion to annul has been lodged in the name of Maggie Chapman. I'm now going to invite the committee to dispose of the motion to annul. Can I invite Maggie Chapman to move motion S6M14791 in her name and make any brief additional comments she wishes to make? Moved formally, convener. Thank you. Can I invite any other members present, followed by the minister, to make any brief remarks that they wish? No requests. Minister? No further comments. Thank you, convener. Thank you. Can I invite Maggie Chapman to indicate whether she wishes, wishes to press or withdraw motion S6M14791. I press. Thank you. The question is that Equalities, Human Rights and Civil Justice Committee recommends that the High Court of Judiciary Fees Order 2024 SSI 2024-237 be annulled. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There will be a division. Can I ask those in favour of the motion to raise your hand, please? Thank you. Can I ask those opposed to the motion to raise your hand, please? Thank you. And can I ask those who are abstaining to raise your hand, please? The result is one for, six against, and zero abstentions. The motion to annul is disagreed to. We will now move on to agenda item eight, and that is to consider a motion to annul SSI 2024-238, the Court of Session, etc. Fees Order 2024. A motion to annul has been lodged in the name of Maggie Chapman. I'm now going to invite the committee to dispose of the motion to annul. I invite Maggie Chapman to move motion S6M14792 in her name and make any brief additional comments she wishes to make. Moved formally, convener. Thank you. Can I invite any other member present, followed by the minister, to make any further brief remarks that they wish? No requests. And minister? No comments. Thank you, convener. Thank you. Can I invite Maggie Chapman to indicate whether she wishes to press or withdraw motion S6M14792? I press. The question is that the Equalities, Human Rights and Civil Justice Committee recommends that the Court of Session etc. Fees Order 2024 SSI 2024 238 be annulled. Are we all agreed? That is not agreed. There will be a division. Can I ask those in favour of the motion to raise your hand? And can I ask those opposed to the motion to raise your hand? Thank you. Can I ask those who are abstaining to raise your hand? The result is one for, six against, zero abstentions. The motion to annul is disagreed to. The ninth item on our agenda is to consider a motion to annul SSI 2024-239, the Justice of the Peace Court, or Court Fees Scotland Order 2024. A motion to annul has been lodged in the name of Maggie Chapman. I'm now going to invite the committee to dispose of the motion to annul. Can I invite Maggie Chapman to move motion S6M14793 in her name and make any brief additional comments she wishes to make? Moved formally, convener. Can I invite any other members present, followed by the Minister, to make any brief remarks that they wish? No requests, Minister. No further comments, thank you, convener. Thank you. Can I invite Maggie Chapman to indicate whether she wishes to press or withdraw motion S6M14793. I press. 
Thank you. The question is that the Qualities Human Rights and Civil Justice Committee recommends that the Justice of the Peace Court Fees Order, Court Fees Scotland Order, 2024 SSI 2024-239 be annulled. Are we all agreed? No. That is not agreed. There will be a division. Can I ask those in favour of the motion to raise your hand? Thank you. Can I ask those opposed to the motion to raise your hand? Thank you. Can I ask those who are abstaining to raise your hand? Thank you. The result is 1-4, 6 against, 0 abstentions. The motion to annul is disagreed to. The tenth item on our agenda is to consider a motion to annul SSI 2024-240, the Adults with Incapacity Public Guardians Fees Scotland Regulations 2024. A motion to annul has been lodged in the name of Maggie Chapman. I'm now going to invite the committee to dispose of the motion to annul. Can I invite Maggie Chapman to move motion S6M14794 in her name and make any brief additional comments she wishes to make? Moved formally, convener. Thank you. Can I invite any other member present, followed by the minister, to make any brief remarks that they wish? No requests. Minister? No further comments. Thank you, convener. Thank you. Can I invite Maggie Chapman to, to indicate whether she wishes to press or withdraw motion S6M14794? I press. Thank you. The question is that the Equalities Human Rights and Civil Justice Committee recommends that the Adults with Incapacity Public Guardians Fees Scotland Regulations 2024 SSI 2024-240 be annulled. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There will be a division. Can I ask those in favour of the motion to raise your hand, please? Thank you. Can I ask those opposed to the motion to raise your hand? Thank you. Can I ask those who are abstaining to raise your hand? The result is 1-4, 6 against, 0 abstentions. The motion to annul is disagreed to. So, Thank you, everyone. That completes our deliberation on the SSIs. That concludes our business in public today. I'd like to thank the Minister and her officials for their attendance, and we will now move into private session to consider the remaining items on the agenda. Thank you.